Hi and welcome to a new episode of Building Resilience. Is there more to autonomous vehicles than a transportation solution? How does this innovation affect systemic societal change? And what does resilience have to do with all this? Ronald Coopers, advisor on complexity, resilience and energy transition, a research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Amsterdam and a professor of practice at the Thunderbird School of Global Management, is going to take us on a captivating journey of climate change, complex systems and their resilience. For those interested in an evolutionary approach to the climate crisis, I highly recommend reading Roald's latest book, A Climate Policy Revolution, What the Science of Complexity Reveals About Saving Our Planet. Through this podcast, we are bringing resilience research and practice closer to you. If you enjoy the content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your thoughts in the comment section below. Your views and your feedback are extremely important to the development of the podcast. Enjoy our conversation. Resilience only makes sense in the context of complex systems. Only complex systems have resilience. Non-complex systems don't. Um, and, and therefore, in order to understand resilience, really, you need to understand enough about complex systems, right? You know, you don't know. But, but only in that, if not, it's another one of these consulting concepts. You say, what's resilience? Oh, for me, it's these six things. And then for somebody else, it's another five things. And then you don't know. But you know, in in complex systems, the, you, you have again the intellectual running room to understand what resilience really is, and so, and and it's like everything around complex systems is quite simple. Is resilience essentially two properties? Is one is called robustness, um, and that's making something stronger. So since we're here in the Netherlands, is you know we have robust sea defenses, you know high dikes, you know solid and all that. Uh, but the other component of resilience is adaptive capacity, and it's the adaptive capacity in the interaction with the threat. And that's also now very familiar because a vaccine is an example of that, is you inject a weakened version of the threat into your immune system, and your immune system adapts to be able to withstand the threat in the future. And so the combination of those two things is robustness and adaptability is resilience. Um, and, and, you know, non-complex systems can have robustness, but non-complex systems can't have adaptability. Clocks don't adapt. Cell phones don't adapt. Ecosystems adapt. Societies adapt. So complex systems have adaptive capacity and non-complex systems don't. Hi, Roland, and welcome to Building Resilience. Hi, thank you very much. Great to be here. I have just read your book, A Climate Policy Revolution, What the Science of Complexity Reveals About Saving Our Planet. And I have been very impressed. I, you brought a lot of optimism in my life <laughs> because I thought that um, we are going to stay with all this, what seem to be big changes, but in our hearts don't feel like, like they make a difference. But seeing climate revolutions through your eyes, through the eyes of, of uh, complexity, I feel like, yeah, maybe this is the answer. It just feel like, yeah, we've, we've touched it. Some, some, we can do something with it. So I'm very, very happy to, to have this conversation yeah. with you. Thank you. And I, what I tried to do was, you know, there's plenty of reasons to be pessimistic about the climate, right? So I'm not naive. Uh, we're not doing well at all. Um, but that doesn't help, right, in a sense. So what I wanted to do was write a book about how change might happen and how it can happen quickly, because we no longer need just change, but we need nonlinear change or system change. And that's actually possible. It's far from easy, but it's possible. And the fact that it's possible, I think, is important to understand um, and and just to, to, to go after. And so uh, um, and I think that's the reason for the optimistic tone. Um, because it's the it's the only way you get people into action as well. We know if you know through doom and gloom, people just become depressed. So, for sure, and at some point, we just don't want to touch it anymore. We just don't want to get into that discussion anymore. Yeah, no, I have a friend who who said when you you know if you know you're on the Titanic, you go first class, and you know that's not very useful. <laughs> <laughs> Roland, just to start with. Uh, I've looked a bit on your background and what you've studied, and but it would be nice and I think quite interesting to understand your journey to becoming a thought leader in complexity, resilience, and climate. 
Yeah, no, thank you. It, it's, you know, it's an interesting uh, fascination, right? Because some people say, how on earth do you get interested in this thing? And it started quite early on as I studied theoretical physics, which in a sense is a, a really about asking the deep questions about, you know, how does anything really work? You know, it's a quite a philosophical thing. So I, I graduated in what was an early version of complex systems on the large scale structure of the universe, <laughs> long story. Um, and then I chose not to pursue a career in science, uh, but ended up in industry. And I spent what felt like a 23-year internship in, uh, in industry, uh, first in telecoms and then in, in energy uh, with Shell, the, the second half. Um, but my fundamental, and so I did all sorts of things because you get paid a lot and you're supposed to do things well. So I was the head of the gas business. I was the head of, sustainable ener of sustainability for Shell and so on. But my interest, real interest, was always, you know, how do things work? And so I once took a sabbatical between two careers for a year and really discovered uh, this story of complexity and the complexity. I describe it as a slow motion revolution in science, probably like the Enlightenment has been a slow motion revolution in the 18th century. I think it, it may be comparable. Um, and that really fascinated me. And it, I thought, you know, this provides the intellectual running room, not the answers, right? But the intellectual running room to grasp, to grapple with all these problems. And about 10 years ago, I quit industry because I thought life's too short. And in the end, you know, it's a relatively predictable world. And so now for the past 10 years, I've been writing and teaching and doing advisory work all in this area of system systemic change and, and how it relates to policy and management and trying to bridge from the theory to okay you know how do you how do you actually make a difference on monday morning because that, that bridge i think is the interesting thing to and perhaps one i can contribute something to having one leg in both worlds in a sense and maybe it's the hardest to build as well yeah you do it's, what you can, right? Yeah, for, for sure. <laughs> uh, what should we understand about complex systems? Um, f first, is the world it's the world's worst name for a discipline, right? Because people have an association with the world complex, right? You may have a complex relationship with your sister-in-law or something, and, and that's a real meaning for that word. But when we talk about complex systems, it's something different. I always put up a picture of of uh, the braided hair of Nigerian women who have these beautiful braids in their hair. It's extraordinary because in Latin, plexus means to braid. So complex is with braids. So complexity is the science of braided or interconnected systems. And so what I encourage people is to say, okay, open a separate compartment in your head for the meaning of that word. It's different than the complex relationship with your, whoever, your boss or whoever it is. Um, and the other thing is that most things in the world are complex systems, most interesting things. The economy is, social systems, ecosystems, the climate, and et cetera. And so understanding that type of systems is really critical. Uh, the other beautiful thing is they're remarkably simple. Um, and uh, it, that's kind of a paradox, but it's in a sense, it's the laziness of reality is that the underlying fabric of reality is rather simple, but it leads to these very complex phenomena. So one very simple example, and I use the word simple purposefully, is a tree, right? A tree is this wonderful, amazing structure, but the algorithm at its heart is kind of grow, split, grow, split, grow, split, make a leaf, and then you have a tree. But that simple, generative mechanism yields complex structures. And that's actually very typical for, for complex systems all over, is that they look amazingly complex, but at their heart, they've got simple principles. And I think that that's, uh, is, is, you know, what makes it exciting and fun and, uh, and important, actually. Are we far away from the tree uh, parallel to where climate is? Well, the, the issue with climate is weird in the sense that that is actually not a complex issue, right? In itself, it's quite simple. We have to stop emitting carbon into the atmosphere. So the what is really simple, 
the complexity comes in the how, not the what, is, is because it involves humans and their motivations and society and social norms and economies. And all. that's where the complexity comes in. The climate's actually remarkably simple. It's just, you know, stop emitting the stuff and it'll be fixed. Um, in opposition, for example, to the biodiversity collapse, which is another, that actually truly is a complex issue. Um, but so the complexity lies in the solutions, actually not that much in the, in the, in the climate issue itself. In what we have to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I read your book and then you're talking about various actions and various options that can have this really good effect on our climate from uh, definitely redu reducing carbon emissions to autonomous vehicles to cleaning up the ocean maybe even nuclear energy at some point we even touch on on uh, psychedelics and they all seem like promising solutions is any of them the magic bullet and can no. they also fail yes none of them are magic bullets and all of them can fail <laughs> And, and that's actually typical for complex systems, right? Is that there typically isn't one solution and you're not sure that there is one solution. So you have to experiment and try and learn about the systems, um, but you're not operating in the dark, actually. You know, we've had 30 years of complexity science um, and, and we know some things, you know, for example, we know that social norms are contagious in the same way, actually with the same mathematics as the contagion of COVID-19, which we're unfortunately super familiar with. So for example, there are wonderful studies that look at the, um, at the spread of the adoption of solar panels in cities, uh, because that follows the same mathematics as a pandemic. And what that means practically is that if your neighbors put up solar panels, you're more likely to put up a solar panel. And why, and I've had this experience here in my own house in Amsterdam, is if you put up solar panels, your neighbors come to you and they say, why did you do this? Does it make sense? Are you now also a vegetarian? Why do you still drive a Porsche? You know, you, it becomes an, a norm and an identity thing and not just an energy policy. And I think that's the richness of, of this, of, under, of you know, putting on this complexity lens is that you look for the interconnections as opposed to a more traditional framing that would say, oh, solar panels get adopted, get adopted when it's cost effective. You know, which clearly, you know, people aren't really, you know, just look at your feet, right? You, you haven't bought the most cost effective shoes you could imagine. I don't think anybody does. And this is, so this whole myth of cost effectiveness. I mean, it, it, it's a factor, but it's not the driving one. And so the systemic lens provides us a much richer understanding of, of how these things work than the more usual frames, which are kind of the economic frame or the, or the, or the, you know, the authoritarian frame, right? Somebody tells you that you must have solar panels. I'm kind of curious, and I researched it and I couldn't find it. You made a parallel in the book uh, between uh, reducing the uh, plastic bags in Australia, the consumption of plastic bags, and the one in Ireland. Yeah. What was the contagious? What happened in Ireland that was so powerful that I think in just a few days, weeks, they managed to terminate the consumption of plastic bags? Yeah, no, this is an extraordinary and, and illustrative story, right? So. You know, they, and this is already now ten or ten years ago, or something. This isn't a recent thing, but so at the time, this was a big deal. So the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Finance had agreed there was going to be a tax on plastic bags. Ministry of Finance thought great extra tax, and Ministry of Environment thought great less plastic bags. And they'd made projections, you know, that, you know that this was going to to gradually reduce. And what happened is that within three months, the the um, the consumption of plastic bags had reduced by 95%. You know, great for the environmentalists, the tax authorities weren't as happy. Um, and this is typical of complex systems, right? They have these non-linear changes and it's a bit like water freezing, right? Is as soon as you hit zero, the whole thing freezes. We've seen this in the canals here in Amsterdam, right? Last week. Um, but still be surprised, right? This is an amazing thing. You have a sudden activity and um, and so it's this. It's actually a similar phenomenon: is that you have this sudden change, and it's because of the state of the system before. You know, there were all these things in place, 
in terms of willingness and people already feeling uncomfortable with plastic bags, possibly cultural things, stories, myths, you know, all of this allowed the system to gel all of a sudden. And they did the same thing uh, also in the Netherlands, for example, they introduced a small tax on plastic bags. And the Dutch thought, great, this is a good deal. Let me have another plastic bag. You know, it didn't actually make any difference. And so this, you know, the skill is understanding it isn't, it has nothing to do with the tax. The tax is a trigger towards system change. And you need to understand, you know, what, how, how to make the system ready so that the trigger can work. Um, but it's, and in Ireland, it was not purposeful. And so part of the point in the book is that, you know, we have to learn to do these things purposefully is look for system change catalytic moments as opposed to say, oh, that was great. We didn't expect <laughs> that, right? So, um, for, for sure. Can we, one of the things that you're discussing is autonomous vehicles. And I'm a very big fan because I cannot drive. So for me, it's very, it's a very practical implication. Yeah. How can we make these contagious? Because people are still afraid that they are not going to drive their own car. Yeah. If you, I asked taxi drivers and they pretty much said, no, autonomous vehicles will never, I did it here in the Netherlands, will never replace uh, uh, cars. Because who is going to step in a car and like to be driven by a robot? No one. So they, they will always need us. Yes, famous last words, right? Um, yeah, I mean, so, uh, you know, I have a Tesla that's pretty much autonomous already, right? So it, technologically, it's there. But the, 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 and so, you know, autonomous vehicles are interesting for, um, for transport because people like you don't have driver's licenses, et cetera. So there are all sorts of reasons why it's a cool thing. Uh, the point I make is that the interesting thing is actually the interconnection with other systems. So don't think of it just as a transport solution, but as a societal change solution. And there it becomes really interesting because if you have um, collectively owned autonomous vehicles, right? Not heavy Teslas, but you know, like you know, pods that drive around, then there's a real revolutionary change potential. For example, it frees up a third of the space in cities because you no longer need parking. So we can actually reinvent cities in a way that's more sustainable. We could also make them worse, by the way, right? So, so there's a, it, this isn't a ready, you know, the energy consumption goes down by something like 90% uh, in transport. And transport's the one sector that actually has been, has not reduced its carbon emissions. Most, many other sectors have been successful, but transport's really, uh, um, and it, it will change social norms, right? It, it, you know, we're, addicted to consumption and cars for most people is the biggest consumer purchase. And so there's identity status and all of that associated. And if you get rid of that, there's an opportunity to redefine what material status is. And again, it could become worse, but when there's an opportunity to redefine, you, 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 you get rid of path dependencies and you can make things better. So the point I think of autonomous vehicles as interesting and cool as they are for transport, it's actually more interesting to see what, ever, what else might change in society. And that's typically not taken into account. When you look at, you know, all policy studies around autonomous vehicles, it's always about, you know, making transport better. And the idea is if you, if you think of society in these complex systems, you sort of say, okay, well, what's the opportunity to change adjacent systems by changing, um, by changing this this transport thing, and there it's amazing, right? There 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 are uh, there are extraordinary opportunities, but also threats, right? Because the the traditional fossil car companies um, will want to retain you know the individually owned heavy consumer article because that's their business, um, and and therefore to get to this world of collectively owned you know Uber on demand kind of uh, transportation will require breaking a few eggs, right? It, it's, there's a lot of lobbies to push back on. Uh, but the first thing is for policymakers to be clear that this opportunity is there, as opposed to just kind of incrementally keep the thing going as it is today, which is the, which is the danger. <laughs> you already touched on path dependencies uh, or addictions, as you call them in the book. Can you give a bit more detail about that? 
Well, uh, Brian Arthur, who's you know one of the great writers about complexity and, and so on, he, he describes it as as a path dependency is that systems carry their history on their back. So it's the fact that you know the past matters to the future. So the past, to a certain extent, determines the future. Something we know very clearly from our own lives, right? Your education, your family, all sorts of things in your from your past determine your future. And guess what? It's also true for other systems. Um, and that's technically referred to as past dependency. Now, traditional, you know, economics and and policy often ignores path dependency. There's this assumption that, you know, if cost benefits are there, things will change. The reality is that they don't. It's, things have momentum. So, so you need to understand that momentum. And in some cases, uh, what I argue for is you need to purposefully cut path dependencies. So you might have policies that actually purposefully destroy something in order for something else to be able to, to arise. And, and that's not something we often do and would require a really interesting kind of narrative, right? To say, well, you know, we're doing this now because um, that's the only way to create the space for this change to happen. Yeah, what Germany um, did with COVID, nuclear energy. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, indeed, the, 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 the exam, yeah, that's right. The example I give is the, the nuclear shutdown in Germany. Um, <clears throat> which people, you know, disagree on whether that was a good or a bad idea from an economic and energy point of view. But from a system change point of view, it was really interesting because, you know, the German power system was stuck. You know, people in the big companies thought, you know, real men don't do renewables. There's a gender angle actually to this as well, which is kind of interesting, is real men don't do renewables. They do, you know, big, heavy equipment. Um. And, you know, they were thinking, you know, other people will put up some windmills and solar power, but, you know, will be there for decades. And when the German government essentially yanked away the option of nuclear, they all said, well, wait a minute, the system won't work anymore. And the point was, you know, exactly get stuck in. And that cre you know, restructured the German energy system, you know, the number of companies went out of business. And that was kind of the catalyst, like the pricing of the of the um, Irish plastic bag, it was the catalyst that that was a catalyst that that changed the system. Now, what I don't know, and I hope someday, when she's soon retired, to have the opportunity to ask Angela Merkel, is was this part of the plan or was this a side effect of the plan? And um, I, I don't underestimate her, so it may well have been a part of the plan. But I don't know. It'd be fun to ask her. Yeah, she's a pretty thoughtful person. Yeah. But, uh, how do you feel about the policies that are now being enacted, like uh, banning plastic straws, uh, taxing carbon? Are these the significant changes we are looking for or not yet? Well, there are lots of things we do that are good, right? And so banning plastic straws is a good thing. Um, but it's not it, it, the challenge is to find solutions that are commensurate with the problem, right? That have some path to actually solving the problem at the scale that we have it. And you know, banning plastic straws, you know, won't solve climate change, but it's not something to belittle, right? It's a good thing, and and so we should absolutely do it. Carbon taxes are a messier thing, is that um I think they're in the category of necessary but absolutely not sufficient. Um, because they won't, and, and the reason is actually quite simple, is because they will be priced at the marginal level, and that won't be enough to get rid of path dependencies. It'll just create change at the margin of things that were liable to change anyway, whereas we need to, to get wholesale, you know, much bigger scale changes. And um, so carbon taxes will have a little bit of an effect, but not that much. It's still a good thing to do, but what's bad is when it's, presented as the silver bullet or the panacea, as quite a few people actually do. They say, if only we had carbon taxes, it would be fine. I, I don't think that's true. And it's not just a belief, actually. You, I think you can demonstrate why that's not the case. Have you seen any initiatives that actually have a chance of uh, challenging the system and changing it? There are a few. 
Um, you know, one of them, which is really an amazing story and not that well told, is the, the change in architecture of the climate negotiations from the first 20 years to the Paris Agreement and afterwards. And, and this is a very profound change, um, you know, led by the thinking of one of my heroes, who's Eleanor Ostrom, who's a, a Nobel Prize winning sociologist, who won an economics Nobel Prize to great anger of many economists. Um, and um, she wrote a beautiful paper years ago for the World Bank that says, you know, why the, the UN process was the wrong process to drive climate change, to, to solve climate change. And because it was a top-down process, the idea was, you know, we can emit so much and therefore we allocate portions to every country and they have to sign up and go do that. Now, we actually know that, that in real social systems, that doesn't work. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't work with your kids, it doesn't work with your friends, and it also doesn't work in society. Um, but what does work, she has described, which is essentially bottom-up solutions with top-down mirrors, in a sense. And, and that's the radical restructuring of the Paris Agreement, was the fact that people come to the table with voluntary commitments, and then collectively they say, oh, it doesn't add up to what's required. We need to do better. And then the golden thing is they invented the ratcheting mechanism. And that's the beauty of the Paris Agreement is that they committed that every five years they would ratchet up the commitments because they said collectively we're not doing well enough. So there's a collective responsibility. Um, and, you know, this year is the, is the year of the ratcheting, which also means, you know, when people routinely say, oh, you know, this is consistent with the Paris Agreements, they don't know what they're talking about because the Paris Agreement's ratcheting, ratcheting, ratcheting. So you can't be consistent with the ratcheting that you don't know what it is yet. Uh, but I think that's one example of where, where people have, have understood that, that we need to tackle the problem differently. And while it sounds like a procedural thing, you know, these things are critically important. If you if the the, the architecture of the process is the wrong one, you're stuffed. Um, so I think that's one optimistic example. I mean, there are others, but you have to scratch, right? Because we're essentially procrastinating. We're not really doing very much on climate policy. Because it feels too complicated. And it's hard to understand what complexity is. And that's why I told you that your book brought a lot of optimism in, in my life because I yeah. finally had a picture of complexity, which I've never had before. Well, that's very kind. I think just people haven't taken it seriously. Um, you know, this, you know, the Marx Brothers is this wonderful quote that say that, you know, denial is not only a river in Egypt, right? And uh it, it, you know, people are just in denial about this whole thing. It's starting to shift a bit. But, you know, think of it. I had a conversation recently with somebody from the European Commission. And, you know, for, with COVID, we, COVID's really interesting because that is a complex, that is complex system management in real time. And, you know, this is not an exception. All issues are like pandemics, except we think they don't, they're not, but they really are. And so one of the things I suggested is with COVID, we have these thresholds, right? Is if the infection rate hits a certain threshold, we lock down or we do something else. And you would, so I asked them, so, you know, could you have something similar, right? Once temperatures hit one and a half degrees, we shut down fossil fuel consumption everywhere. Seems consistent, no? And everybody goes, well, you know, you can't, it's, et cetera. But it's the same, right? I mean, you know, essentially the hospitals are running out of capacity. We shut down everything. In this case, at one and a half degrees, you know, the planet's running out of capacity. Shut down the fossil fuels. Now, of course, it'd be better to have built renewables before and sort of get, but, you know, the, the kind of, the, the same kind of, I mean, I think those are the arguments to have and say, you know, why is this different? And 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 if you want to avoid that, then you know, maybe we should take a few measures before. ...are worth taking, if you're considering the option after we get to two degrees. No, but even two degrees is crazy, right? I mean, you know, people think that two degrees is, I'm not saying you do, but two degrees is a half degree more than one and a half. It isn't. I mean, one two degrees is a massively different world than one and a half. 
you know, and very practically with two degrees, we get rid of coral reefs. One and a half, they survive. And there's a long list of these things. And so do you want coral reefs? And I think now moving towards resilience, we're talking about the resilience of our species. We are talking about our survival and not only. Yeah. So, I mean, resilience is an interesting thing, obviously, but the, one of the things you know I've also written about is that resilience only makes sense in the context of complex systems. Only complex systems have resilience. Non-complex systems don't. Um, and, and therefore, in order to understand resilience, really, you need to understand enough about complex systems, right? You know, you don't know. But, but only in that, if not, it's another one of these consulting concepts. You say, what's resilience? Oh, for me, it's these six things. And then for somebody else, it's another five things. And then you don't know. But, you know, in, in complex systems, the, you have, again, the intellectual running room to understand what resilience really is. And so, and, and it's like everything around complex systems is quite simple, is resilience essentially two properties. Is one is called robustness, um, and that's making something stronger. So since we're here in the Netherlands, is you know we have robust sea defenses, you know high dikes, you know solid and all that. Uh, but the other component of resilience is adaptive capacity, and it's the adaptive capacity in the interaction with the threat. And that's also now very familiar because a vaccine is an example of that. Is you inject a weakened version of the threat into your immune system. And your immune system adapts to be able to withstand the threat in the future. And so the combination of those two things is robustness and adaptability is resilience. Um, and, and, you know, non-complex systems can have robustness, but non-complex systems can't have adaptability. Clocks don't adapt. Cell phones don't adapt. Ecosystems adapt, societies adapt. So complex systems have adaptive capacity and non-complex systems don't. And some people, and you know, this is a weird free world, use resilience as equivalent to robustness. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, but you're, you know, it's kind of a simple idea, right? Just build a bigger wall and you're fine, right? But I, I wouldn't call that resilience. I was looking in the dictionary because in my native language, in Romanian, it means resistance. In French, it means resistance. In French, you can say re resilience. Huh? Yeah. Maybe it's an anglicism. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. The translation from resilience, what came up was resistance. Yeah. And in my language, it's it's resistance. Yeah. It's, we don't and in have Dutch the also, it doesn't work, right? It's fearkracht, which is another thing altogether. And so, I, you know, I'm not a, I don't want to be the word police, right? <laughs> like with complexity. But in a sense, it's good to be clear about what words mean and, and how to make them meaningful and richer so that we understand something new, right? Because to use the same word for something we had another already another word for is what's the purpose, right? <laughs> exactly. But where, that's where the mindset goes maybe. And that's why it's good to have a definition exactly as you, as you said. Yeah. Is it always desirable to have resilient complex systems or at some point we might say that no, resilience is not something we desire. Maybe we desire no. something different. No, re resilience is just a property, right? There, it, there, there's no, it's not good or bad. So um, it's just a thing. It's just a property of systems. So some kinds of resilience are useful and others are not. So for example, uh, organized crime is very resilient. Apartheid in South Africa was very resilient. So there's lots of resilient things you don't want. Um, but there are other things you actually do want resilience for. And um, so you have to pick. And this was one in, in, in the, I did a project uh, at some point for, I think it was nine multinational companies. Who, who, it was, you know, I was talking about nine men in a bar. So nine CEOs of these big companies got together in Davos and they were all men um, and, you know, said, if a city comes to us, and this was the usual suspects, right? Shell, Dow Chemical, IBM, Siemens, McKinsey, you know, the great and the good of the world as they think of themselves. And they said, if a city comes to us and says, help us with our resilience, what do we do? What do we sell them? You know, what do we, 
And so this was a start of a project to 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 try to make practical what what you know what the resilience of those systems means. And one of the first things they wanted is a resilience metric. You know, how can we optimize resilience? And so to, to help people understand that that is not meaningful, is that it's actually sometimes you want more, sometimes you want less. And, and also that the resilience of one part of a system can come at the expense of, an, of another part of the system. So you actually really need to understand, first of all, what the system is and, and what you want with it. And then resilience is an incredibly rich and useful concept, but you can't you know, bring it down to just a number you need to optimize because it, it just doesn't, you know, then you get no value essentially. If there's no number to put behind it, is there a qualitative measure or a kind of assessment that the cities, governments, yeah. uh, companies can run? Yeah. Yeah. No, and you can have proxies, right? And it, this is actually true for most things in complex systems, is there are no metrics that do justice to complex systems, but you can have proxies. A great example is your, is the fever in your body, right? That's a proxy for health. But the goal of life is not to avoid fever. But if you have fever, then there's a problem. But it's also not the fever that's the problem. It's a metric for the underlying system. So in the same way, you can have metrics for resilience that are a proxy. So they're an indicator. So, so you can have all of those. And one of the things we developed in this project was a set of nine sublenses or you know, nine elements that, that build resilience. And we chose them in such a way that, you know, people on Monday morning in, 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 in real jobs would be able to make sense of them and have a discussion about them. Because there's no sense, you know, in having some vague abstract theory that's true, but that people can't use. So, so the fun thing about this project was to try to bridge this reality of complex systems and the whole richness of resilience, but still give people tools so that they, you know, could essentially come to an action plan, right? And decide, okay, these are the five things we're going to try. This is in uh, your Turbulence book, right? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. maybe yeah. we can share that as well so uh, people can have a go-to if they want to, to read about it. Yeah. And that one uh, is open source. You can just download the whole book. I found it on, on ResearchGate as well. True. Just before you said yeah and, and the publisher i mean i got one of the companies to buy off the rights because <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so so it's essentially free to download the whole book which, which seemed then, appropriate then we can we can share yeah. it roland who can lead or who should lead the significant kind of change what are the qualities necessary to lead in complexity well, one thing is to be complexity literate, right? And I think that's, so I, for example, I did a curriculum for high schools on complexity. And I taught that a couple of times to 16 year olds, not a problem. They really get this stuff quite easily. Um, and so, you know, adults, people in policy, they should, you know, they should be complexity literate and, and, and learn this stuff. Um, and along with that, then comes things like humbleness, because you you know that you know you, you can't calculate the exact perfect solution for a complex system, and therefore you have to realize that. Um, so so you know the the traits of of a good leader you associate with that in in a sense. So there's an example I, I sometimes quote. You know, in the Netherlands, we have in multiple political parties. And so some years ago, there was a debate amongst people who wanted to become prime ministers. There were like 10 people. And they asked all these people, are you for or against a third Greek bailout? So that was the issue of the day. And, you know, all the populist and conservative leaders said, hell no, let them drink in their olive oil, right? You know, never. And, um, and you know, the left party says, yes, solidarity, we must, etc." And there was one guy who, interestingly, was a former physicist, who said, I can't answer that question because my answer will be so context dependent, I can't tell you now what I will do. And then he paused. And then he said, but I can tell you what principles I will use to make the decision on the day and you can hold me accountable to those principles. And I thought, you know, this is beautiful because this is a true complexity explanation of something but in a way that I think most people would say, well, actually, that's actually quite reasonable because that's how life works, right? You have to judge on the day, 
but you have to hold people accountable to certain principles. And so, and, and so it's the capacity to be able to do that and articulate and explain problems in those words, I think, is what we, what we require from leaders. And not, you know, you know, we've seen around COVID also, right? All these leaders being tempted into saying, you know, we're getting it under control and in three months we'll have this and then we'll have that. And it's just the wrong approach for these kind of complex systems, right? You, you, you have to be able to say, listen, we're not sure. This is where we are. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. And, but, and articulate in a way that, you know, that doesn't demonstrate that you don't know what you're doing, but that you do justice to the, to the nature of the problem. And, and, uh, and people can do that. You know, good leaders do that. You know, I've just read Obama's, you know, latest um uh book and in, in his reflections he clearly understands that right he, he reflects on you know what's possible like what, what can i get away with what's impossible what don't i know and, and this, this kind of consciousness and the ability to articulate it honestly in those terms i think is what we look for in leaders you touched on literacy did we start introducing uh, complexity courses into MBA uh, schools or higher level, even even uh, lower level, even primary schools? No. no. And, and this is, uh, with a few exceptions, this is quite a funny thing because um, in almost no bachelors or masters do they mention complexity. And when people get to PhD level, they say, ah, there's this thing you have to know about. Actually, things are completely different. <laughs> Um, and that is completely weird. And the problem with that is that, you know, most people who end in policy or management jobs only get a bachelor or master's degree. And therefore, they tend to be educated in a hundred year old science in many ways. Um, this is true for many of the hard sciences. I have to say that the, the, the social sciences are much richer, right? If you look at anthropology and branches of sociology, et cetera, they have a much greater appreciation for complexity. And so economics is a basket case. I mean, it's, you know, they've completely lost complexity, but many of the other social sciences are, are much richer in that sense. Um, uh, and it started, I obviously asked students, you know, how many have heard about complexity? And these days, you know, you may, they may have had a mention or one class or something, uh, but we need, we need to scale this up rather drastically. And uh, uh, it's not that hard, actually. It's not a big deal. And I think the mental, uh, switching that mentality and thinking about things in that way would help with other subjects as well. The, the other thing is it makes people happy. I mean, one of the things I noticed when I taught this to 15 year olds, they became all excited because all of a sudden you presented an intellectual framework that made sense to their world of social media and gender ambiguity and all these kinds of things. It's, oh, I understand, you know, which doesn't make sense in the traditional reductionist framework. And so the kids were super excited. They said, have finally a window into how the world works as opposed to how we want it to work. That was exactly um, so, my feeling when I read your book. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and no, I truly hope that's the butterfly effect that's needed to get yeah, people I mean, thinking about this in the in a complex way, but in a simple way as well. Maybe it's not the right word, but it's just a better way. You just see the whole picture rather than just parts of it. And then you're trying to put them together yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the beautiful thing is that actually we are, we are very good complexity thinkers because in our private lives, that's all we know. You know, nobody thinks that the success of a party is the sum of the invitees. Remember what parties were, right? Yeah. This was in the yeah. in the old days, but <laughs> is the sum of, of the invitees, the location, the light and the food or something. Is everybody understand that it's the interaction, it's the interconnections that make a good party. But then we show up at work and all of a sudden we've forgotten all those things. As we think, you know, we think things are discrete and can be added up and managed separately. And, and so one of the reasons I'm optimistic is that it, it, it's something we know uh, and we just need, you know, the intellectual tools to, to bring it to a higher level and be able to debate and choose all these things, which obviously we don't need to do in our private lives. Um, but as a fundamental intuition and, and access, 
it's not a hard road because it's something that's so deeply familiar. If you would have to leave the listeners with maybe three, five things to know or to where to start with complexity, where to start thinking about whether it's the complexity of their organizations, where is the resilience of their organizations, climate, what would those be? Well, it, it depends what you're interested in. It's one of the beautiful things is that you can always find an area, an example of complexity in an area that you're fascinated with. So if you're a lawyer, there are beautiful stories about you know, complexity and law and the structure of legal frameworks. And if you're in, you know, a psychologist or, you know, at any different area. So I would start with the thing that's close to the thing that you care about. So Google, you know, complexity and whatever you care about, because that's a better way to get into it in a, in a sense. Um, and what I find is is that it snowballs, right? Is once you find a hook, then you you, you know you you look you find all these other things. There's some beautiful even short videos of introduction to complexity on online, and there's all sorts of things. Um, if you're interested in policy, I think my two books, you know, and you know, it's always a very bad bad habit to recommend your own books, but in terms of policy and complexity, I think my two books, one's on climate, the other, complexity and art of public policy, are you know, are relatively rare still so far. Um, on economics, um, Brian Arthur is the key. He's, he's written just a beautiful paper that came out, I think, last month or this month, but there's other materials. So, so it's quite out there, but I would start with a thing that's close to, the, to something you already know about, because then you can experience how it reframes the thing that you know about. Um, and I think that that's I think is the is is absolutely the entry point. Is there something that maybe I forgot to ask you, and you would have, you would have liked to talk about? No, I think we covered a lot of ground. So so thank you very much for a great discussion and a comprehensive one. <laughs> thank you very much, Roland, as well, and thanks for accepting to do this. You're most welcome. Thank you. <laughs>